Good morning. Slightly less early morning today, that's good. I apparently didn't meant to scare all of you away with uh, statistical mechanics on Wednesday. Today we're going to be much more biological. Uh, we're going to go back and look at protein structure. Remember the, this whole approach I mentioned that we started out with biology and then we did a little bit of hand waving for six and then we went more in, slightly more into the hydrophobic effect at least, and then we did the hardcore stat make. And today we're increasingly going to go back to protein structure, but now we will interpret this protein structure and the features we see in terms of proper free energies, entropy and enthalpy. Before we jump into that, let's follow up on some of the study questions. I'm not going to ask you to explain EHSFG. But if you do not know what those are, this is the time to start reviewing it. Because although today, some of the things I say today you will need it for, but increasingly throughout the course, both Lucy and Burke will assume that you know what we're talking about when we talk about enthalpy, for instance. So as a small checkup here, what is the difference between E and H, energy and enthalpy? Yes. Yes, exactly. And as I mentioned, energy is really a stupid name to call this. If we should be proper, we should probably call E potential energy of the system, while PV includes the mechanical work we're doing. Yes. Yes. Sure. Sorry. Uh, potential and kinetic energy. Um, Normally, we don't care so much about kinetic energy, and the reason for that is that the kinetic energy room temperature is roughly fixed in biology, right? Uh, so it's very rare that you will have parts of the system suddenly being at 100 Kelvin. So the kinetic energy is super important, but it kind of ends up being an orthogonal degree of freedom. We have the kinetic energy there. The kinetic energy is what makes it possible for us to occasionally go over these barriers. But it's very rare that we're going to consider the difference of this particular protein, whether it's a 100 Kelvin or 300 Kelvin. There are actually cases where we might have to do that. For instance, if you're freezing it in cryo-EM or so. But in your body, the kinetic energy kind of, it's fixed. It's a distribution around 300 Kelvin, according to Maxwell Boltzmann. Um, but it's a, you're right. Uh, the kinetic energy is included in E2. And then here too, I can just apologize for a few generations here because we know that it's everything except the work, but we don't really care the works. And then we just call it energy and then we happily intermix E with H and everything. Sorry about that. Uh, I wish the world wasn't that way, but I would be lying to you if I pretended that it wasn't. And then similarly, F and G, that too, because we don't really care about PV, right? The PV, the work term, that's really the only difference between F and G. And for that reason too, you will see us happily use them uh, interchangeably. If you're a chemist, you will say just, we'll just say F. And obviously it includes PV, but thank God we work with proteins, which means that we don't really have to care about it anyway. What is the partition function? Yes. So, so yes. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Exactly. So that the Boltzmann distribution only gives weights, right? And but to turn weights into probability, you have to sum that. You have to normalize that over all weights. So why on earth do we call that function? Well, it turns out that as you saw on some of the slides, where at least hand waved a bit. This sum ends up being a way that you can also calculate many things such as free energies, enthalpies, and everything, properties of the system. So the partition function is not merely a normalization this way. It turns out to be, if you know the partition function, you know everything of your system, literally. You can calculate absolutely any physical, chemical property from the system if you know the partition function. And that's awesome if your partition function has three degrees of freedom or if you've started doing the first hand-in task, the reason why we have this super simple hand-in task is we create a partition function that only has a handful of states. And if you only need those handful of states, you understand everything. 
And then the curse and beauty in biology is that we have a partition functions with maybe six million states. Well, six million degrees of freedom, hundreds of trillions of states. I might not have covered question three explicitly, but that's an interesting one. What is stability versus instability? There is a simple and complex answer to this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a long description. I expect you to know that by heart, not. Uh, if we start to look, if you don't know anything, think of your free energies and your energy landscapes. We can reason about most of those things. So let's draw a free energy landscape here. So which state is stable here? Or let's start, which state is the most stable? the lowest, right? So that makes sense because if you are here, sure, we might have some thermal energy, so we might vibrate here a bit, but it's stable in the sense that you're not going to go away from it. So in some sense, in the physical sense, you can talk about stability being the global minimum of the free energy, and that's what we're going to come back to as stable states of proteins, the native states. Yes? Ah, we're getting to that now. Uh, you could talk about these states are kind of metastable, right? So that if you're around here, you might stay around here for a while before you eventually end up here. The question is, what is a while? So I cheated here. Uh, this is some arbitrary degree of freedom, right? But what is the Y scale? No? No? Free energy, right? <laughs> so here's the difference. <laughs> And I know that, sorry about that, that we, so this is a delta G. But there are no units here. So I will completely arbitrarily now say that the height of this particular barrier, if that is 0 0.5 kcal per mole, and we are at room temperature, how stable is that state gonna be? Why? Zero point six kilocal, oh. two point five kilojoules. I know that. Sorry about that. That is great with standards, right? So everybody wants their own. It's really stupid that we have both kilojoules and kcal's, but that means you have to know the difference between them. So it's zero point six kcal. So you're going to fly. This is just going to swoosh by. So with your, so it's like it might be metastable for a millisecond. And that's the type of states that in chemistry we happily just ignore them. So it's not stable at all. But assume that instead that it's five mega calories per mole. <laughs> it's a brick wall, right? <coughs> or is it? You're physicists, some of you. In principle, there is no difference here, right? It's just a matter of time. So here's the complicated thing with biology that in physics, it's just a matter of scales. The same rules apply ever. But in biology, we have these absolute times that are related to processes that are realistic or not. Your life is 100 years. This is going to take way more than 100 years. So for all intents and purposes, if you're a protein, that is a brick wall. And arguing that I'm metastable because I can't go straight through this brick wall and down the stairs, that's what you mean metastable. For all intents and purposes, it's the same thing as stable. So we occasionally talk about these things as kinetic stability. So the real thermodynamic stability, that is true, that has to do with the free energy minimum. But remember that we spoke about kinetics and barriers, right? So you can be stable in a kinetic sense. That means, sure, strictly formally, you're not stable. But in practice, the energy barrier is so high that for the time scales we're looking at, you are effectively stable. And that's the case for most of the things that are happening in your bodies. Um, or, well, at equilibrium, we're all dead. You might have heard that 
And that is the challenge. So stability versus instability is not necessarily that simple. Instability, in a way, it's easier. That on the time scales where here you're definitely unstable, you will move down there. Here you might be metastable, but how stable or unstable are will depend on the energy barriers and the time scales you're looking at. So that's why I said, well, biology here is actually more complicated than physics. We spoke a little bit about phase transitions. Uh, what characterizes a phase transition? You can say this, there are strict physical definitions, but I don't care so much about the physics here. Yes, and it should be something that's abrupt, right? So it should be some sort of all or none transition. Uh, it's not a continuous transition. And then there are first and second order. This gets really complicated in physics, but abrupt change. Uh, I think it's a, for biological reason we would accept that. And I, already, I think we already covered a little bit about how free energy barriers are uh, related to reaction rates. So that the likelihood that you will go over, the likelihood that this reaction will happen depends on that energy barrier, right? So that will, of course, depend on how likely is it that I go from this metastable state up to the energy here. And in principle, the Boltzmann distribution will tell us that. The, uh, on the other hand, the Boltzmann distribution will not tell us exactly how fast the process happens. But if I have two energy barriers that I'm comparing, if this energy barrier was 1 or 2 kcal, and the process would be roughly the same, I can use the Boltzmann distribution to say about relatively how fast would they go. And the difference then, normally, you're, normally you end up with the Boltzmann distribution, well, sorry, normally. The Boltzmann distribution is normally e to the minus delta g divided by kt, right? But that's the likelihood of being in a state. If, if we're instead, sorry, and if, if you, the, the time it will take to go up here, that will, of course, be related to the likelihood. So that would be a minus sign. In chemistry, where you usually talk about how fast something happens, and that's a rate. The rate corresponds to one over the reaction time, so how many things happen per unit of time. So when you talk about rates, then we divide this to with one over this quantity, and that's where you usually end up with a plus when we talk about rate instead. But that's just because you've divided by it. Then I spent quite some time, although I hand waved in a little bit, that we had to understand what is the most unfavorable way during formation of helices or sheets. So why on earth did I end up s spending all that time trying to quantify that peak state? How much time will I spend there? Am I stable here? Well, uh, it has to do with that. What is the derivative? Yes, so in principle I'm stable, right? But it's like balancing on a knife's edge. So I'm dynamically unstable. If you have epsilon motion, I'm going to fall down. Uh, so I'm static stability, but dynamic instability. So the fraction of time I'm going to spend here is zero, because there will always be some noise that pushes me in one or another. So why, did it, why should we bother about that state? Sorry? Exactly, right? Uh, to go from that state to that state, I have to cross that barrier. But who cares? If I'm not going to spend any time at the barrier, why should I bother about it? <coughs> so it will determine the reaction rate, as I just told you, right? That is the delta G value I know. If I know how high that is, I can estimate the barrier, and then I can estimate how fast things will happen. So it's not that I'm interested in the state, but I'm interested in how long it will take to go through it. And in principle, it's not enough. If I find one state here, there could always be a lower state. So if there was an even, assuming that there was another path between these two, it would, could always be even faster. But if I find, find one way for this to happen, that's a possible way then there might always be something even better. And that's why, we case, at least I had to hand wave a bit that this was also likely the best possible way, the lowest path, but I didn't prove that. So related to that, what was then the hydrogen bond pattern in the most common helix form? This is repetition, but it's important to know. <laughs> 
But what is the hydrogen bond pattern there? I to I plus four, right? So the reason why I brought that up the other day, because that is what gave us, you have four residues that are stabilized by two hydrogen bonds. And that's what causes this extra initiation term that is effectively the barrier we have to go over. And then we uh, at least hand waved a bit. Uh, if you think about in terms of free energy, what components favor versus disfavor alpha helix folding? Mm -hmm. So what's that? Is that favorable or unfavorable? Favorable. So what is disfavorable? Entropy. So that's putting the helix in this particular conformation. Sorry? The I sorry I missed that. Favoring. The, the favoring was the hydrogen bond, the, in particular the enthalpy of the hydrogen bond, right? Well, actually, the hydrogen bond involves uh, entropy too, but. The fact that you can form these hydrogen bonds between adjacent residue is very favorable for the alpha helix. So that as we're forming more and more hydrogen bonds, you're gaining enthalpy. But are there less hydrogen bonds forming through the orbit? No, uh, but they're, they're slightly stronger. They're more polar and everything. Um, and in this particular case, the water, because the alpha helices are typically not hydrophilic, uh, sorry, not hydrophobic, that the waters are quite happy around them too, so the water is not going to lose that much entropy. But it's a really good question because that the hydrogen bond per se is not a purely enthalpic effect, right? As we told the, uh, the other day, there's both enthalpy and entropy involved in the hydrogen bonding too. So I, maybe the best way of saying that is really the free energy component here primarily has to do with the hydrogen bond as a whole. But overall, the commonality between eight and nine I want to get to here, in general, for all these things, when you're forming something, to us it looks nice to have something ordered and regular. Nature abhors that. That the beautiful regular shape of an alpha helix is horrible because that you're taking something that was very free and forcing it to be restricted. And that costs entropy. It's really bad. On the other hand, then we must have something else that compensates for that, right? And that's usually then enthalpy. No, oh, it has to be enthalpy or some sort of other entropy that gets even better. There was a great paper in Biophysical Journal this week actually about this, uh, arguing that you're gonna see later on in the course when we, I already showed you some examples there, you see almost like a funnel going down that the protein finds the minimum. And it looks nice, it's narrowing, but that's not good at all. The narrowing per se is actually bad because you're losing entropy as you're going down and that has to be compensated for. But the reason for having both of these, what's the difference between helix and sheet? No, I think both, both of them benefit from hydrogen bonds, right? And both of them lose the entropy. But if you think about the alpha helix, the alpha helix is a very local structure. So it's a matter of turning, you orient two local amino acids close to each other and you also form the hydrogen bonds local to each other. When it comes to beta sheets, the hydrogen bonds are global. You're gonna get the hydrogen bonds to some other strand that could be quite far away in the sequence space. And it's also the orientation here you're gonna take two very different parts of the chain and put them together to form the beta sheets. So both the entropy and enthalpy terms of the sheet are more global, while for alpha helices they are local. And that's also this global nature of it or that the beta sheet is effectively two-dimensional. Um, that's actually why I didn't have time to tell you that on Wednesday actually. You can show that the beta sheet is actually a proper phase transition um, while the alpha helix, in the alpha helices, the coil and the sheet can coexist. But then we're getting into deep parts of physics. Yes? No, but... Uh, no, it's, uh, no, no, that, that has something to do with the favor of it. But with the sheet, with the alpha helix, you will gradually, as, as soon as you get over that initial barrier, right, the helix will gradually grow. There's a beautiful example of that that I'll come back to later today. Uh, when it comes to the sheet, it's very much all or nothing. So that the sheets can take a very long time to form. When they actually form, they will grow rapidly and suddenly, boom, they're stable. So they have this abrupt nature that we talked about, phase transitions. 
I spoke a little bit about helix dipoles, but I covered that uh, already earlier uh, this week, so I won't repeat that here. Uh, oh, sorry, and, that, and this was also the, the sheet phase transition. This has to do with that the helix is one dimensional. Why is the range of formation rates for beta sheets much larger while that's not really the case for alpha helices? So that had to do with these kinetics and the energy barriers, right? And I showed that the speed is gonna have to be related to this peak. And for alpha helices, the height of that barrier was really only due to the hydrogen bonds. Um, and that's not really that different between two different residues. Some residues will be slightly happier, but that's mostly gonna influence the stability, not the rate of the formation. But beta sheets, since you actually need to form this entire hairpin, the two strands, for the beta sheet to even start forming. That means that the beta sheet formation barrier depends a lot on how stable a number of residues are in beta sheet. So if you have residues that are very unstable in beta sheet, you can have a gigantic barrier, but eventually they, the entire sheet can still be stable. So it ends up depending a lot on the stability of the residues. I think we already covered microstates and macrostates. Uh, I realize that's a lot of work. Well, actually, I'll repeat that. Uh, so what is the difference between microstates and macrostates? I think that's a beautiful, beautiful explanation. Multiplicity is a great keyword. Because as always, everything depends on definitions, right? If you're a quantum physicist, you might say, oh, we need to do this on the quantum mechanical level, including electrons and everything. We ignore that. We look at the proteins. But at some point, the microstate has to be unique. So whatever, whatever way we use to define how things are different, there is always, the microstates are unique. There is no, never any multiplicity inside a microstate. While the macrostates, that's some sort of way of lumping things together. And you could argue the way I treat this, of course, in my protein state, I have lumped together a lot of electron states, but I don't care about the electrons. I still just consider that one state. On the other hand, in, so in chemistry, I might think the stuff I observe in the lab is one macrostate. But this is in principle entirely up to you to define. And, and again, that's as always the curse of statistical physics. You have all the freedom in the world, but when you have all the freedom in the world to define things yourself, they become fairly abstract and fuzzy. But multiplicity is a great way of thinking about it. So what is the entropy then? What states? The logarithm of the number of microstates within each macrostate, right? And then we have the Boltzmann uh, constant too. So it's literally just a correction factor. So that to be able to use all our equations but focus on macrostates, then we need to count the number of microstates in it. So it's purely a mathematical construct to help with this. Yes? Uh, the hmm? I'll use the helix. Uh, remember that I said that we had all these dipoles, right? The, in the peptide bonds. So that when you take lots of small dipoles and line them up, that's gonna correspond to a gigantic dipole going from minus to plus. Uh, the start, this is the start of the helix, and terminus. We always draw them blue. And the, that's all, but the dipole will go in that direction. But if you have a gigantic dipole, that corresponds to like having a small minus charge here and a plus charge there. And the capping then means if you have a plus charge here, what type of amino acid would you like to put here to stabilize that? A negatively charged amino acid would be really happy there, right? Because it's gonna be like the negative charge finds the positive one. And similarly, a positively charged amino acid is gonna be really happy here. So the reason why those things are used, you actually see these patterns in biology and you can use that, today we wouldn't use that, but you could use that to predict where are helices. Uh, so if you see these patterns just in the sequence that are super cheap and easy to get from genomics, we can actually start to use them to define structures. 
Lucy will come back to that a little bit of bio bioinformatics. A long time ago, we did this. Uh, today, we have so much data that we, we use machine learning in computers instead. We don't try to apply physics to find sequences. And as I also mentioned a little bit, the reason for bringing up this particular feature of the beta sheet range of formations is that that what leads to a bunch of these aggregation diseases that people even think that's Alzheimer's and a whole lot of diseases has to do with this bi gradual building up of plaque. I mentioned bone, uh, bovine spongiform encephalopathy, mud cow disease, and that has to do with beta sheets that are gradually growing. And in a way that, this is just stupid. Why, why wouldn't evolution take care of this? Make sure that, why should we have these proteins? What on earth can be good with falling ill? So we don't know, um, and literally, we don't, but one can speculate. So how does natural selection work? But when do mutations happen? And when does the selection happen, right? In our offspring. And when do we typically get offspring? In particular, historically, you would be 20 when you had your offspring. Today, it might be 30, 35. So diseases that you get when you're 60, 70 has historic, well, so first, mankind historically, man didn't grow to be 60 or to 70 to 80 years old. So historically, there has been virtually no evolutionary pressure for anything that happened in that age. And even if it was, you would have had your offspring long before this type of diseases happened. So that is very bad for the individual, but for the reproduction of the ray, for the reproduction of the DNA, the cell and everything, it doesn't really matter. It does matter to the individual, but, uh, and that's the strange thing that then happened with mad cow disease and everything. If you then start to eat brain, whether it's in hamburgers uh, or in cow food, then we might reintroduce some of these things so that rather than getting the plaque to reach a critical level when you're 80, you might suddenly have, start having a critical level when you're 20, and that is bad. Today, I'm gonna jump back and look at real proteins. Um, there are some classifications here, but I think this is gonna be much easier if we start looking at proteins. There are three gigantic classes of proteins, and I'm a bit sad because I would have left the most fun to Lucy, but that's, that's all right. There is a fairly boring class that's by far the most common in your body. It's these large building material structure, carotene, fibrous proteins, um, skin, nail, et cetera. And then there are all the water-soluble proteins that we call globular, which roughly has to do with the shape. Most of them are circular, and that partly has to do with these droplets of oil and the hydrophobic effect. And then there's this really cool classes of proteins that exist inside the cell membranes. The membrane itself is hydrophobic, and the reason why we love them, virtually all our research uh, at SciLife Lab and my team is on these proteins, and that's, they're effectively the windows and doors into the cells. Any 70% or so of the revenue of modern drugs are targeting membrane proteins. It's a super important area and one where Sweden in particular and Stockholm is world leading. There's some of my colleagues at Stockholm University. There are a ton of different tools to study proteins. You will see some of them in the class later on. Uh, if you want to download one, there is a program called VMD that is developed by colleagues at uh, Urbana-Champaign in the US. But the point here is not so much, I think you will be looking at this viewer, but my point here is to stress that there are different ways of representing a protein too. You can choose to look at every single atom, but if you were to look at every single atom, things rapidly become very complicated, right? So here too, depending on what you're doing, we can start to look at just, we can plot just the C alpha, so you get some sort of backbone trace, or we can draw the secondary structure, or we can draw the secondary structure but keep all side chains, and in this particular case, we used a different color for a group that's bound. This is so-called heme group that's binding the oxygen. And there's none of these representations is more or less correct. But the reason we use them is kind of to stress the regularity of the patterns. If you look at one of those two top examples, you don't really see the helices, right? And in a way, the helices aren't there. The helices is just a sort of regularity in the pattern. But for me, I much prefer, I tend to use representations like that because I don't want to be, I don't want my focus to be disturbed by seeing all the side chains and everything. I want to see the, the big, the grand scheme of the protein. 
the reason why things fall into these patterns is entirely due to the amino acids. As already mentioned with Christian Amfinsen and Cyrus Leventhal, these structures are unique. If you put a, side, if you put a chain in water, it's always going to fold into the same shape, with very few exceptions. And then I already hinted to you that there are some examples here. Proline is exceptionally rare in alpha helices because it can't form this hydrogen bonds. So it will break the alpha helices. Glycine doesn't have any side chain at all. So it's very free in this Ramachandran diagram. And that means that it's beautiful to have if you need to make a very quick turn and go back. The helix capping we just covered means that some residues are more common at helix ends. And then there might be differences inside versus the surface of the proteins. What is the difference you expect to see there? We covered that the other day. Hydrophobic inside, yes. Uh, and that has to do with these classifications of proteins. If we draw up all of them there, this abundance, it came from the genetic code, remember that? There is no fancy biology here. The percentage of each amino acid here is entirely due to the genetic code. So this is the fraction of the various building blocks we're gonna have when we create proteins. And the last column here is this delta G of solvation that literally describes how easy this is to solve in water. Is minus 10 kcal per mole a lot? Or minus 60 if it's charged, or minus 80? So first, what does the minus sign mean? It's a favorite process. And the process of solvation is when we take it from gas or some sort of inert base to water. So minus, remember that I said, what was KT? 0.6. 0 .6. So we're talking about minus 80 compared to 0 0.6. This is going to be so downhill that there is actually difficult to measure it because there is so little that will not be in the water. So if you have a protein, if I give you a protein model and say that, look, I predicted the structure and I think that there's going to be a lysine right in the center of the protein. You're going to say that you're wrong. That um, it won't happen. Those things, those things are impossible in practice in chemistry. While of course minus 0.76, that could go either way. We can draw these amino acids any possible way. Uh, I already mentioned that glycine is super flexible. Alanine is also fairly flexible. Uh, it just has a CH3 group at the end. And alanine can go either way. Uh, it's okay to be in helices, but sheets are also okay. Glycine, on the other hand, hates to be in helices and sheets. Why? It's small, it doesn't have any side chain. Why should glycine hate being in secondary structures? So what was favorable versus unfavorable when you put things in secondary structure? Sorry? Mm, well, but glycine can form hydrogen bonds. That's no problem. Loss of entropy, right? So any of these processes, remember that you can't just look at one state. You have to look at the before and an after and what is the difference. So you now have a residue that's exceptionally flexible. This is going to be super happy out in water or so. And if you take this residue, this is going to be happier in water than the other residues because it's so small and flexible. And if you take this residue and move it into a helix, relatively speaking, glycine will lose more freedom by being forced to be in a structure than some of the others. So for glycine, it's actually the entropy that causes us. There are a bunch of longer hydrophobic residues. Uh, just to get to know that C alpha is the first atom, and then we typically, then we not, don't have more imagination that we continue along the Greek alphabet. So the beta carbon, the gamma carbon, that's if you continue out the side chains. Cysteine is another small cool residue. Uh, we have a sulfur atom here. Cysteines are special because these hydrogen, under some conditions, you can actually lose these and form, if you have two cysteines that are close to each other, they can form a bond, a crosslink. I'll show you how that works. Um, so if you have one chain here and another chain here, those two cysteines can form a bond between the cysteines. And then there's literally a covalent bond between the two chains. And at first sight, that might seem like a small quirk or so, but that is 
generations of biochemists are using that. If you want to find out if two parts of a protein, just a sequence, you don't have the structure. And if we want to find out what these things are, let's try to insert two cysteine residues. That's very easy to do in a sequence. And then you try to create this type of bond. And if a bond then forms, you knew that they had to be within roughly one nanometer or so in space. Otherwise, that bond couldn't have formed. Covalent bonds, do you know anything about the strength of those? They're very strong. So I'm going to show you another small protein. This does not look like a protein, right? This is just a random piece of coil thrown together. I can show you all the side chains too. It's still not particularly interesting. And then I'm going to show you two cysteines here. Oh, sorry, three, six cysteines. So there are three pairs of cysteines. Do you see them in yellow? And they have all formed crosslinks. So you've taken this small piece of super flexible coil and then we've glued it together. So this is really creating the entire structure. So this turns out, you wouldn't believe it at first sight, but this turns out to be a super stable structure. And it's actually a neurotoxin that certain spiders use. And if you have a small molecule and you want to be able to inject it in your uh, victim or something, and then it should be super stable and bind to the voltage sensors in the channel actually. This particular molecule has a fairly fun story. Uh, so that was discovered by Kenton Schwartz. And he actually named this after his daughter, uh, Hannah. So it's called Hannah toxin, uh, which apparently made his wife furious. <laughs> um, but as Apparently, so when you're 16 year old, it's pretty fun, cool to have a toxin named after you. <laughs> we already spoke about proline, and the key thing with proline has to do that, that since you looped back, you know, we have lost, you see that the carbons are binding the nitrogen there, right? So the nitrogen will not be able to participate in a hydrogen bond once it's part of the helix. There is a reason why I'm going through all of these for you. Um, so if you give me a little bit of patience. Uh, tryptophan is a big and bulky amino acid. It has two rings. One of these rings is quite hydrophobic and the other one has an ability to form a hydrogen bond there. There are all sorts of, if you're a, an organic chemist, there are all sorts of funny way of classifying these. Proline is strictly an amino acid. The tryptophan ring is an indole group, et cetera. Forget about it. That, we care about the physical properties here. Uh, it's not an organic chemistry class. But here you can probably all see it. The, hyd the hydrogen bond forming part there is going to be quite happy to interact with solvent. But the big aromatic ring there, that's hydrophobic. And that's not going to like to interact with water. So that would like to be turned into the inside. And some 15, well, slightly more, almost 20 years ago now, uh, this was used to create one of the world's smallest artificial proteins. So at some point there's a definition of what is a protein. Well, anything that's a collection of amino acids, we can call a polypeptide chain. To be able to say that it's a protein, we wanted to adopt some sort of stable and unique structure. And that's not really enough because you could argue if it's just a single amino acid that has a structure. So typically we say that there should be some sort of inside. There has to be some residues that are not exposed to water so that there is a surface outside and there is an interior inside. And this TRP cage is literally a cage where you put a tryptophan on the inside. And I'm going to show you a small movie of that. Uh, so when, even 20 years ago, we used a hand wave about these things. This particular structure was, I think, determined both by NMR and it might have been X-ray since too. Uh, but these things are small enough that when I was a uh, student your age, we dreamed of being able to use physical rules to predict proteins. And the cool thing is that we can do that today. So this is a protein, if you throw it in a computer, we can simulate how it folds. So what happens, so let's see here, if we turn this on. These are colleagues of mine, Vijay Panda's team, did it, that do you see here, this is going super fast, that it's exploring all typical co uh, possible conformations in space. It's moving across these energy barriers. Every time you see it be not moving, it's kind of metastable, right? And then it crosses another energy barrier a few milliseconds, well, a few uh, microseconds later. And then eventually you end up in this state, which is actually the lowest free energy state. And that corresponds to the experimental X-ray structure. So these are horribly simple representations. It's using the type of force field we showed you. There is water all around this. Um, 
but based simply on physics, these things hold, which is quite cool because it's really reconciling things with Amundsen and everything. And it's also showing that despite Leventhal's reservations, one way or another, these molecules are able to find each other in the range of milliseconds. There is no biology here. We don't have any ribosome that's helping us to find the structure. We're not guiding it. We're literally just throwing a small chain in a virtual water box, and then we're using the laws of physics, and the laws of physics will guide it to us. And that's also the reason why I go, why I went through all these slides with different residues, right? The, what gives us this uniqueness is that all these residues have slightly different properties. At first sight, you might think that some residues are better than others. And in, in some ways they are. It would be difficult to form a protein that has 20% proline residues in it uh, because it would be, they're too big and too bulky. But in this particular case, this bul big bulky difficult residue was really what stabilized the protein. And in other cases, you might need a hydrophilic residue or a hydrophobic residue. So the difference between, say, super simple plastic bags that are polymers and proteins is that this heteromeric nature of proteins, that's what gives us the uniqueness. Uh, why I specified this particular fold is stable for the protein. But if I change that tryptophan to another residue, the protein you just saw would not fold. So there are the other pattern, I think I already mentioned these, well, you mentioned these patterns, that polar residues, they are frequently present in rare regions close to the surface. Uh, they love to have form hydrogen bonds with water. Uh, charged residues, they virtually only occur in surfaces, or if there is some sort of internal active site. Some of these ion channels I showed you, there the charged residues can almost appear in the membrane, but they're not really in the membrane. So you've effectively created some small water cavity or something. So it's effectively a water environment, even though this water environment then goes through the membrane. And then was, this was this helix capping that I spoke about. I also mentioned earlier this, or last week, that the charged residues, it's a bit sloppy to call them charged, because anything that's charged in chemistry has a pKa value. And that is the pH value where this charge will either well, the residue will either leave, uh, sorry, it will either donate or take up a proton from water. So the, when we talk about charged residues, I typically think about what is the charge at neutral pH, pH 7, which is, might not strictly be what you have in biology, but it's, again, it's good enough an approximation. So that all these residues that have very high pKa values, arginine and the lysine, they typically have a charge of plus 1. Glutamic and aspartic acid, low pKa values, virtually always minus one, and then histidine, as I mentioned in biology, there's always an exception to destroy our beautiful rules, 6.5. Why did it have to be 6.5? Because this is so close enough that it can go either way. <laughs> Depending on what residues you have around it, if you have lots of negative residues around this histidine, it can actually be good for the histidine to be charged. So all bets are off with histidines, just as the backbone cis-trans for proline. Yes? Uh, do you remember, ooh, at some point you likely calculated chemical reactions. Do you remember equilibrium constants in chemical reactions, K? Mm. So that the Ka, that's really the equilibrium constant if you have Xh plus H2O on the one hand, and then this can go over to say X minus plus H3O plus, so that the X group here would donate the hydrogen to something. Uh, and this is of course a process that can be either further to the right or to the left. And depending on the process, the balance here will depend on the equilibrium constant. But it gets very complicated to talk in terms of equilibrium constants and everything. As chemists, it makes much more sense. Well, we wanna know at low pH, uh, it might have, at low pH, it might take up a proton or vice versa. So the pKa value, it's literally the same way when we go from the concentration of hydronium ions, H3O plus, to pH. And here we use, instead of having to talk about the K value, we can talk about this would correspond to the pH value where this reaction is exactly 50-50. So it's just a simple way to think about what is the pH when you will start to change your proton rather than having to worry about the specific concentration. 
the way you should think about this is that just remember that by default, you don't want charged residues inside proteins, but under some conditions, things can become non-charged. You can deprotonate them or protonate them to make sure that they're neutral, and then they're slightly easier to insert. But you might have to spend energy to achieve that. The reason why that is important, I hinted about last week, early this week too, that charge is a very nice way to exert force on something. If you have it charged and put it in an electric field, it will move. So it's the way we use all these small channels. Uh, let's see. No, sorry, that's the wrong type of movie. Uh, if you have a small channel that should either, for instance, close the, um, there's a water pore here that would normally go through. If you have hydrophobic residues here, at some point when this moves in, you're effectively going to cut off the water pore. Do you see what's happening here? that the water is gradually breaking and around two microseconds or so, now you really cut off the water here. So now this channel will no longer be conducting. So if you have lots of hydrophilic residues, you will have water inside a pore. And if you then move them in, but most of them are hydrophobic, you can cut off that flow. Similarly, if you have these large, uh, no, that's both ligand gated. If you have large, uh, Oh, now I know, sorry. This particular channel is pH gated, that's why. So normally you have, would have things charged, but when you change the pH from 4.6 to 7, the residues lose their protons. And when they're no longer, and when, you have, when, they're, um, when the residues are no longer charged, right, they're not gonna repel each other, other as much. And then they can get in proximity and then you will close the channel. Um, sorry, I was thinking about voltage gated channels. Voltage gated channels, I think I mentioned the other day, right? Voltage-gated channels, they need to open and close, and we achieve that by ha literally having small pistons, just like it was an engine, move up and down in the cell membrane when we change the voltage across the cell membrane. So nature likes to use charges to do things biologically. There are tons of different ways of uh, classifying things, and depending on these properties, they're gonna be more common in main chains, side chains, whether they are in helices or sheets, I don't expect you to know these things by heart. But over decades, we've learned quite a lot, first to understand things in terms of physics, but these are also patterns that nature has used. And you would imagine that a simple way to achieve things, that we, we could use all this physics to predict what proteins looks like. And it's a really great idea. People did it 40 years ago, but what we have since realized is that no matter how smart we think we are, you are not as smart as 4.3 billion years of trial and error. So what we're increasingly doing now is that we're just letting the computer sort out the sequencing and let the computers find something that's similar to something we already know. We don't try to understand the physics. But this is the reason for the similarity. Proteins can't swap out residues anyway. Proteins kind of have to swap out residues to maintain these patterns. You can't take a hydrophobic residue and replace it with a hydrophilic one because then you would likely no longer have a stable protein. But nature is unfortunately smarter than we are when it comes to the physics. I already stole three extra minutes here. So let's take 15 minutes and reconvene just after, let's say, 18 minutes past the hour or so. And then I will take you through a few more actual structures. So that overview of amino acids brings us to the actual proteins we're going to have a look at. And the first class here is what are called fibrous proteins. And that's, that literally has to do with the nature of fibers. Some things, things that are long, they're large, they're structural building blocks. To tell the truth, they're at first sight, as proteins, they're somewhat boring, uh, but they are important. One of the classical examples of this has to do with silk fibroin. So it's a very small amino acid repeat. It's really alanine and glycines that are very flexible and then combined with a bit of serine. Uh, and this still turns into gigantic anti-parallel beta sheets. Uh, so if you feel silk and everything, you're just, that's basically you're just feeling beta sheets. This has a very peculiar, and the, the reason for the, uh, for the beautiful luster here is that this simple repeats of the beta sheets. It's very well packed and they're mixed hydrophobic, hydrophilic, hydrophobic, hydrophilic. So it's almost like a, like a crystal, but not quite. If you go down to the uh, hygiene outlet, you know, the supermarket or anything, you will have these shampoos and everything where they claim that it contains silk protein and everything, and it's completely artificial. It has nothing whatsoever to do with silk, but they've generated artificial protein that looks just like this. 
this is another very peculiar structure that I'm just going to show it to you so you've seen it. It's also a very small repeating pattern, glycine, proline, proline. Normally, you would never believe anything could be stable with that pattern. But, and it doesn't. But if you take three chains right next to each other, it turns out that you can create a beautiful regular. I even think I have a movie of that. Yes. You can create a beautiful chain that have first some hydrogens inside the chains and then some other hydrogen bonds mediated by waters. So it's not just surprisingly stable, it's very stable. And this is the basis of bone, teeth, skin, and it's basically 25% of what you are. We are, sorry, we are fairly boring. <laughs> this aggregates into gigantic quaternary structure. So here you have the amino acids in the chains. Three of them create this small collagen helix. And then you create a number of those chains into a gigantic superhelix here. So do you start to see this hierarchical thing? It comes back. Nature likes to uh, repeat and reuse building blocks. So you only need a very small gene coding for those three amino acids. And then by repeating it, you can create gigantic structures. And you can actually see this in the electron microscopes. Uh, the, the first, if you look at uh, a tooth or something. If you take that glycine and mutate it to anything else, remember that I said that the glycine was fairly flexible and anything? If you mutate that to almost anything else, you create uh, what's called a brittle bone disease, so the bones become very fragile. Um, so it's a very, and the, re the reason why it becomes so severe is that you will have, have a ton of mutants in the structure. But it's just an example of this hierarchy and how you can create, for instance, the skeleton. Another very common pattern, again, that's, these patterns are somewhat boring because that's to create this super gigantic structures, we can't use all the freedom in the world. You can take two helices, and just as you paired up two beta strands, you can take these helices and just coil them around each other. That is called a coiled coil, because E its helix is already a coil, right? And then you have two of them, that's a coil that in turn is a coil. So it's a coiled coil. It can be more than two, but it's fairly rare. One of the classical example of this is in your muscles. So that the fibers that contract, it's literally two of these muscle fibers, and then you have a small protein called myosin that they effectively have one protein that is walking along this fiber that causes muscle contraction. Super fascinating. You can find movies of this on YouTube. Although, you might recall that I said uh, helices was usually 3.6 amino acids per turn. Uh, it's very common that these are 3.5 instead. That would seem stupid. This is not easy, so I'm going to tell you that. If you take two such turns, how many residues will it be between them in that case? It's not hard, Mark. Seven. Instead of 7.2. So if you have... Normally, this would be, say, hydrophobic on the inside. But if it's exactly seven, you can, for instance, take two residues here, make sure that either both of them are hydrophobic, or make sure that they can form a hydrogen bond with each other. So by having exactly seven, you make the entire thing quite tight. So it's almost like having a little bit of glue between those residues. This might not look great at all when you uh, first look at it. You're going to have a ton of collisions there, and that's both true and not true. The easiest way to look at this is by using some of these alternative representations. Because yes, there are, there are atoms all over the place in a helix. But if we forget about the sizes for a second and just draw the molecular surface here, this kind of like ridges and valleys on the helix here. And they're, they're not really ridges. They're just points where the side chains are sticking out. But you can think of that as ridges going either along the solid or dashed lines here. So if you now take a second such helix, and then you rotate the round and try to fit the ridges of one helix into the valleys of another helix, then there are going to be at least two patterns where they will fit, right? And this, well, here everything is clashing. But if you take these and rotate them roughly 20 degrees, they fit perfectly. So this is what you call helix packing. Um, so again, that you might have seen this structure before. It looked very irregular. Why didn't we have beautiful, nice, parallel helices? Well, because if they were parallel, their side chains would clash. But just as the beta sheets slightly turn relative to each other, if the helices are rotated, if one helix is rotated slightly to the next helix, that is actually how we achieve packing. So it's not just that it's suboptimal. This is optimal. Having them perfectly parallel would not be optimal. 
And this recurs. We see this all the time in these coiled helices. And that's why it's so useful that you have these coiled helices. They're gradually twisting around each other. Do you see here that they're gradually moving? And these red residues, if it's now 3.5 per turn, every seventh residue, if you make that a leucine, which is a small, well, mid-size hydrophobic residue, we're going to have lots of leucines in the helices. That's a hydrophobic residue, so that does not like to be exposed to the surface. But all these res red residues, they will now pair up against each other. And because it's not exactly 3.6, oh, sorry, 7, uh, uh, sorry, it's not exactly 3.6, but 3.5, this gives them the slight turn so that the red residues per se is acting like a glue and holding the helices together. You can even have some cysteine uh, bonds here. Remember those disulfides we talked about, and this can make it even stronger. So these can become super rigid structures. There is a common place where this occurs, and that is hair. Uh, so your hair is out. Just as your skeleton is beta sheets, your hair is the first approximation alpha helices. And it gets slightly more complicated. So you have these small uh, alpha helices there. They end up in coiled coils. And then you're paired of these coiled coils. And then you end up having roughly eight or so of them coiled up in larger protofibrils. And then you keep adding up the size until you get to these cuticles that have, might have something in the uh, diameter of 0 0.1 millimeter or so. But it's literally just a ton of alpha helices lined up. And again, use hierarchical structures to reach macroscopic scales. So if you would like, imagine that you were a chemist and you would like to reform hair or force glue hair into a particular structure. There are some tricks you can use here. What if you were to take those cysteine groups and first we reduce them, so we break all the cysteine groups, all the disulfides, and then you form the hair the way you want it. And then we add another chemical to reform all the cysteine groups. So that will effectively that you can shape hair permanently. And that's literally what you do. If you go into the hairdresser and get a permanent wave, that used to be popular in the 70s and 80s. You're literally working with these disulfide groups to create a permanent pattern. And in the department of almost useless knowledge, actually it's not at all useless, uh, alpha, your alpha helis is growing at roughly 10 turns per second. It's 3.6 residues per turn. And if you ever forget how fast alpha helis is forming or anything, you can calculate it backwards that way. And from that, you can calculate roughly how fast your hair will grow. And it, it's, uh, it's surprisingly accurate. Uh, even if we derived, remember the last uh, lecture where I had some hand waving about how fast alpha helis is formed. We are right within an order of magnitude. Just from very simple reasoning of physics and the hydrogen bonds, the free energy barrier you have to get over. There are a ton of other uh, things. Like elastin is another cool one. Uh, and that is the uh, component that you have in blood vessels, uh, which at least when you're young are very elastic. And when you're sadly getting to my age or something, that elasticity decreases for tons of reasons, in particular because you have all this fat depletion inside. But there is a lot of experiments today of designing biomaterials, that materials that have biomimicking properties so that you can create an artificial protein that has properties like a natural vessel. But that's stupid. Couldn't you just have a piece of plastic or something? Well, you can do anything you want with plastic, right? So that you have much more degrees of freedom in plastic. But could you imagine any advantages to using amino acids? What will your body think of amino acids? It's happy. It looks like any, any other material in the body. You're not, the second you're introducing methyl or something, you have problems that your immune system will attack it, right? Your immune system is not going to attack a normal protein that looks exactly like the protein should like. So that they are biocompatible, which is a very nice feature. I'm not going to spend more time talking about fibrous proteins because, they, yes, they're super important as building blocks, but they're not that fun in terms of studying structures of physics. So I'm going to continue on to globular proteins that are these small sphere-like shapes that can be either helices or sheets or a mix of helices and sheets. There are the fascinating thing with life science, that life science develops much quicker than physics. That's actually what I love with it. But the challenge with that is that we're still in the middle of that development. So when I was your age, it was super important to take look at small structures and classify them. Exactly where do the helices sit? Exactly where do the sheets sit? Uh, 
I even think the Finkelstein book loves to draw them in different colors and classify what is the topology. And we're gonna look a little bit into that, but this is less and less important because we have the computers doing this for us. And to tell the truth, this works for a small protein like hemoglobin or whatever. Yes, it's hemoglobin on the left. But if you have a ribosome with 60 different chains, it's just too much information. We can't handle it. So as proteins have become more complex, we're giving up on this way of trying to treat them. But it's, you're likely seeing the irregularities in the helices and sheets here, right? Uh, and all these gradual twists and everything had to do with the particular properties of the amino acids. Beta sheet structures, they're simple. Uh, but here's also where biology comes in. It's virtually impossible to have anything with just one sheet. So physically you can have one sheet, but the problem is that you can't really, that's having a piece of paper. You can't draw anything on a piece of paper. Well, nature doesn't know how to draw yet. So if I have one piece of paper, you can't separate anything. Both of them are accessible to the water, right? It's gonna be difficult to have any function. It's also gonna be super floppy. So what you typically do is that you have at least two sheets. And remember that I showed you fatty acid binding proteins because the second you have two, you can have an inside and an outside. And that's likely caused by evolutionary pressure, exactly why we don't know. And initially you might think that all sheets should be beautiful. They should be perfectly planar. That would make sense. And I lied a little bit to you and said that if you just look at the sheets, the amino acids are on opposite sides. The problem is that it's not exactly 180.0000 degrees. So on average, it might be 175 or so. For one amino acid, it doesn't matter. But if you then have lots of them, that's gonna lead to these slight twists if you, if you now start to look between the strands, right? So the fact that they're twisting here, that's not an artifact or that is not as stable as it should be. All sheets will be slightly twisted because they are not exactly at 180 degrees. Um, there is no particular reason why the amino acids bonds should be at exactly 180 degrees. And again, if you do something very simple uh, with two sheets, there are, I already mentioned the fatty acid binding protein. The other way could be to put the sheets, rather than having a crisscross orthogonal pattern, you can make them aligned. Immunoglobulins uh, is very common, super important molecules in your uh, immune system. There is another one, I'm not sure whether I have that protein, called gamma crystalline, which is a crystalline in the lens of your eye. It's also a beta sheet. The reason why this works so well to solvate the fatty acid I already hinted about, did you see all these red, si green side chains there? And if you take every single side chain, make them hydrophobic, every single one, make them hydrophilic, you can literally create this, think of a sheet of paper that has a property A on one side, property B on the other side. And it's a beautiful way of separating compartments or so. Oh yes, I even had the gamma crystal in here. That's, that's what your eyes are made of. On the other hand, you see that in addition to the sheets, you also need to connect these loops. And that seems a bit stupid. It doesn't just go up, down. It keeps jumping back and forth in some sort of strange way here. That way, at first sight, it might appear strange, but those loops are actually quite nice because having slightly longer loops makes it possible to close the structure at the bottom and the top. So they're not unused, they're not junk. These turns literally help create the entire compartment. Because otherwise you would just have a can without bottom or top, right? Uh, and that's great if you want to look through it, but it's not great if you want to close it. The first person to identify this was Jane, Jane Richardson. Um, and this pattern you can see before, they're called Greek keys. And the reason why they're called Greek keys is that she noticed the similarity between these patterns and the patterns you would have in a Greek urn. So why on earth would you have these similar patterns on a Greek urn as you would have these things going back and forth? Is it a pure coincidence or? So what's special with the pattern on the Greek urn? You all know it, it's just that you're not thinking about it. How many times do you have to lift your pen to draw it? None, None right? So it's, you create a pattern that has some sort of built-in beauty. It's kind of two-dimensional at least, but you're never lifting your pen. What does that correspond to in the protein? You can, it's a pattern that you can create with one chain, right? 
because if you had to add these tops on bottom and top separately, you would need multiple chains expressed by different genes. Again, a gene will express one chain. So this is nature's way of creating a small repeating pattern, but still having these things on the bottom and top, but doing it as part of one protein. So it's not a coincidence at all. It's a very nice geometric feature. I think this was a nature paper in 1977. Well, you might not have been born there, but I, I was five years old then. So it's fairly, compared to physics, this is, the fun part here is new. Um, I think we see the fatty acid. Yes, that's the fatty acid in the fatty acid binding protein. Uh, nowadays, we have x-ray structures there. So here you see uh, an oleic acid that doesn't sound sexy to you, but it's super sexy to me because this is what I've spent the last 20 years of my life on. These are the chains that become the tails of the, of the lipids in your membranes. So all the fatty tra fat transport and everything in your body, which is super important uh, to understand, both transport and a whole lot of disease. This is actually another way that you might not think about it, but your body is what you eat, not in terms of proteins. Proteins are synthesized from your genes, but your membranes are created from what you eat. And this is how nature builds it, uses the building blocks. So the point here is that there are not really that many different topologies or different patterns of generating things. And that's simply because that these are complicated molecules. There are not that many things that are both regular and that can be reused. Uh, you virtually never see mixed parallel and anti-parallel beta sheets because it's, you need a pattern, right? Uh, and it's complicated to mix different patterns. It's easy to stick to one pattern, um, but there are always exceptions from everything. And this all comes down to the properties of amino acids. And that's why I took you through all those different amino acids. The specific properties of different amino acids will stabilize these structures. Different amino acids will stabilize different structures. For instance, alpha helices. And in addition, uh, there will never ever be any knots in a protein. They have, if you take the two ends of a protein and pull, the string should come out straight, right? There should never be any knot on a protein. And then there, of course, always an exception in biology, pepsin. <laughs> this protein, do you see that the chain goes, let's see here, the chain goes from blue over here and then the yellow part actually goes inside the green here. Uh, so it has created a knot. So why on earth would you like a knot here? So pepsin, have you heard the name? Where do you think this protein occurs? It's alimentary. Um, your stomach. So what's the pH in your stomach? You're not even close, like one. It's like, it's really aggressive with uh, sulfuric, uh, with uh, not sulfuric, it's HCL. Normal proteins, the whole point of your stomach is to digest proteins. And that's a problem because you now want the protein to work in an environment that digests proteins. The only way to make this protein stable is making it super stable. So the reason for this knot is likely to create a protein, nature wants a protein that's super stable. Here too, there are some topology features we see and others we don't see. Uh, the reason why, again, the reason why this interested us historically is that we could use this to predict what the structures must look like because most of them never exist. Today, we let the computers do it. So it's more of an historical interest that for whatever reason, not every single way of putting these building blocks together are stable. But what they can do that if you have two of these proteins, um, Let's say this beta sheet. Do you see what they can do? These are separate molecules. And this, so the green one is a small beta sheet and the blue one is two. But if you now take them and put them together, you create an even larger beta sheet because you get hydrogen bonds all the way here too. This is very much related to what I said at the beginning of the lecture today, how you form these large plaques, right? So they have one protein adding another protein, adding another protein. So you can form structures that consist of billions of proteins. And the larger they are, the more stable they will be. And that's roughly all I'm going to tell you about small beta sheet structures. Alpha helices, on the other hand, they, we already mentioned that they had slightly different properties. So let's have a little bit look about what alpha helical structures might look like. Alpha helices, they look completely horrible in comparison. The only real requirement here, these helices need to be packed one way or another. So remember with beta sheet, 
that strand depended on the next strand, depended on the next strand to be stable. That's not the case for helices. Each helix is roughly stable on its own. And then you just need to find one rough way of packing it. And the reason why this looks like it's just a bunch of helices thrown out in space, that has to do with this not crossing each other, well, not crossing them exactly parallel is actually better because you want them to pack against each other. I might have. And here too, there are a bunch of different ways of so it. We might have something that's just curled together. Um, we might have them where they're twisting a bit. In this case, there's almost a hole in the middle of the protein, right? Can you imagine where this protein occurs if I didn't see the name here? <laughs> if this is hydrophobic on the outside, you can put it, the entire thing in a membrane, right? And then we've literally created a hole in the membrane where you can push through ions. They're super common as ions. Huh? Or you can, under some conditions, you can put all of them nicely parallel. They're not exactly parallel, but they're relatively parallel. Let's have a look at all these. They're simple, so let's start with them. Uh, they're called, if you have four helices and put them together, we just call them four helix bundles. And there are a bunch of different ways we can draw that. So if you look at these, which one appears to be most stable and nice? I would probably guess cytochrome, right? That one is horrible. Oh my God, this must have been an experimental error. <laughs> they can never have gotten that published. And this has something strange in the middle here that, ah, whatever, it might not even be stable without the thing in the middle. The reason for this diversity though is coupled to function. And all these are stable, but they're stable under slightly different conditions. In all of these cases, the helices go up, down, up, down, up, down. So two helices that are right next to each other in sequences, they are anti-parallel. They point in opposite directions. That cytochrome on the left is very, uh, it, it, uh, it occurs uh, in lots of different organisms, but they're very di diverse domains that are typically involved in electron transport. You can't see that just from the shape of it, but nature has basically created a nice building scaffold, the structure, and then by having specific side chains, we can create things that can, for instance, can stabilize electrons in different states. That means that they are frequently involved in binding metals, um, sometimes in higher organisms, but it's very common in bacteria. Uh, there is a small bacterium called Chevanella or Nadensis that I, I forgot how many uh, cytochrome domains it has, but it has like tons of them, dozens or a hundred which is a lot because a bacteria might only have a few thousand genes in total. I spent about six to 12 months as a postdoc working on this. Um, and it was a grant that I think is prescribed now, so I can confess it even if it's a recording. Um, we were simply interested in understanding protein folding in general. So we had a project where we wanted to map out all the domains of this uh, small organisms. And we, to tell the truth, we really didn't care that much about the organism. But this was in the US. Um, so the Department of Defense was super interested in Chevanella on Adensis, and we got a large grant from them for that reason. Why do you think they were interested in Chevanella on Adensis? Radio radioactivity, right? So that if you can get bacteria to bind radioactive metals, you can essentially cause the bacteria to take up the radioactive metals and use this, and nothing ever came out of this. But so there are lots of potential engineering applications of bacteria in general, because these things, they will interact with molecules around you. They will typically interact way with way higher specificity than any normal chemistry experience can do. And again, in, in physics, you can separate anything, but if this material is now spread out all over nature in very low concentration, you can't take all the soil in Stockholm and purify it with a physical method, but with biological methods, we can. So we're basically enslaving bacteria at work for us. The second, one did not start out as a protein, actually, but started out as this um, small black, uh, it's an infection on tobacco plants, which is not particularly important in Sweden, but in large parts of the world, we're talking about billions of revenue. Tobacco is a very important crop. If you put this in an electron microscope, uh, you will start to see some sort of regular patterns here, like small rods. And if you amplify that even further, you're going to start to see things here. So this is 50 nanometers. Uh, so here you're almost starting to see small domains, parts of proteins. So these small black things are actually the domains, the T and V domains I showed you. And at first sight, they look just strange. There's no regular pattern at all to this. Um, 
until you get an X-ray structure of this. Uh, so do you see that the fact that this was kind of pointed, that's the whole point, haha, <laughs> pun intended. Uh, so that the small part here is packed on the inside and that has to be smaller than the part on the outside because otherwise they wouldn't fit as well, right? So here too, evolution over billions of years has optimized the particular fold to stabilize this protein. Yeah. So this is the virus. What do you have on the inside here? The red part. RNA, RNA yes. So what, what will that RNA do? Mm -hmm. So that RNA will infect the cells of the plant, right? And it will en enslave the cells of the plant. What does that RNA code for? What does that RNA? So RNA, you store your genetic material in DNA. A virus stores its genetic, mat genetic material as RNA. But could you imagine, what, what might that RNA code for? It just codes for that domain. Just one for your little bundle, nothing else. And you think you're beautiful? Sorry, we're fairly ugly factors. Can you imagine that the efficiency of life? This is a molecule that has been optimized for one person, one purpose only. You only need encoding for one specific protein, pretty much. Well, you need a bit of a reverse transcriptase too. But one building block and it creates a stable environment that protects its RNA from the surrounding. It's so amazingly beautiful that I have no idea that it was a religious feeling that Nature, because you are, we are slow, ugly, complicated features that expend a lot of energy to reproduce or anything. It doesn't get more beautiful than this in nature. Although technically, this virus is not really alive, right? It doesn't have any turnover process itself or so. But if you define life as replicating genetic material, you could argue that it is life. The person who discovered this is actually a friend that you met before. Rosalind Franklin of DNA fame too. This was her first real project that she actually got full credit for in contrast to the DNA. And the, then we're gonna move to a slightly more complicated structure. I haven't forgotten the third part. Um, this is a much larger protein now, uh, hemoglobin. What does hemoglobin do? It carries oxygen and it's, the reason we like that it was one of the first proteins ever to be determined. Um, it's easy to follow. It's actually complicated because it's a hemoglobin consists of four different groups. Um, so you have the same building block four times. And then inside each of these, you have this protoporphyrin group. And the protoporphyrin that binds iron, we call a heme group. So that's the group that is actually able to bind the very, com well, stabilize an oxygen uh, molecule. Hemoglobin, if you look at the single unit of it, it has a bunch, I think it's six alpha helices. Uh, and then you need very special amino acids, typically a histidine up on each side that are pointing into this region where you're binding this entire heme group. So the heme group is typically not covalently bound, uh, but it's very nicely stabilized as part of the protein. Hemoglobin and my, there is another, sister molecule of this, which is myoglobin. And myoglobin only consists of a single molecule. And I might come back to that. I don't remember if I'm gonna come back to this later on in the class. Uh, they were actually, that was determined by Kendrew, almost in parallel. And the reason why you have, why on earth would you need two molecules in your body that both bind oxygen? That sounds like a waste. Yes, we do. Couldn't we just get rid of it? Reduction, cost savings, fewer genes, that should be more efficient, make you more like a bacterium. Yeah, but then you could just have one gene and express more of it. So, uh, so if you look in your hemoglobin, should hemoglobin be good or bad at binding oxygen? Good, so you want it to bind oxygen really hard. Why? So you want it, so of course, if hemoglobin is good, where, hem, where does hemoglobin get its oxygen? In the lungs, right? So that, yes, if it's minus 20 kcal, that's awesome. You're gonna be really good at binding oxygen. Unfortunately, now, two seconds later, your hemoglobin is now gonna release the oxygen to your muscles. 
and you have minus 20 kcal. <laughs> that molecule will never be released. So the problem is that on the one hand, you want a molecule that it should bind oxygen really efficiently in your lungs, but then it should release it really efficiently in your muscles. So this is a fairly complicated interplay where hemoglobin has, when the concentration of oxygen is low, it has relatively low affinity binding energy to oxygen. But the more oxygen it binds, the stronger it binds it. So in the lungs, when you have lots of oxygen, hemoglobin will actually be good at binding it. But in the muscles where the oxygen concentration is lower, hemoglobin will actually change its mind and realize, you know, on second thought, I should get rid of all my oxygen. So then hemoglobin hands it over to myoglobin. So myoglobin you have in the muscles, while hemoglobin in the blood. I would never have come up with that, but nature had slightly more time. Remember, so you had six helices here, right? Remember that we also spoke about this, eukaryotic genes, genomes that have introns and exons that not all parts of your DNA actually codes for things, but that you have to take your DNA and stitch certain parts together. And based on that, what are the parts, what do you think that these blue, green, red, blue, and orange parts correspond to? The helices? Uh, this would have been such a great idea if it was not completely wrong. Uh, so there are three exons in the DNA, but they cut straight through the helices. They have nothing whatsoever to do with the secondary structure. We still don't really know where the introns and exons come from. Um, but I just, just because it's so obvious to think that they correspond, to, the, the introns and exons stitching happens much sooner than any folding. So their exons have nothing to do with it, but it's important for other reasons. Um, and you can actually show that you can take just one of them and they will kind of uh, bind the hemoglobin a little bit anyway, but that's a parenthesis. The reason for bringing this up is not just that I wanted to fool you, but again, to drive home the message that biology happens as we speak. And when I gave this lecture a year ago, it was really cool. So this is just a year old. That a year ago, there were the first, well, there have been lots of it, but there are, we're getting all the time new ideas. What are the interactions role and what are they doing? So compared to physics, where most things happen in the 18th century, here things are literally happening now. Um, and that's what I love with the field. This is so not the ultimate response, but we're learning a little bit all the time. I think I already mentioned this helix ridge and grooves for you. Uh, but if there are at least two different ways of packing these, you can either pack them that way, right, or that way. Then you can start making statistics. So what are, if you take the axis of each of the helices here. Let's start to do some sort of informatics. Just let's calculate what are the angles of their crossing. 10 degrees, 15 degrees, 20 degrees, and look through all the 100,000 structures or so we know. And then you can start making databases of this. Um, so what are the things that do occur? And here too, as we already hinted, there are pretty much only two ways that these things can be packed. We could, in theory, use that for protein design. Uh, so if I now to, if I then take a model, I take two helices, and I know that they should be either roughly minus 50 or say plus 15, well, plus 20. Let's try to build some side chains there that stabilize each other and see if I can, can I create a small artificial protein that is stable such as a small four helical bundle? Well, that's possible, but then I also need it to stay stable. So one way of looking at this, if I now look at my two helices from the top, so that's one helix, and the reason why you get this pattern right is that it's 3.6 residues, 100 degrees for each residue, so 3.6 residues per turn. The sequence there might not tell you a whole lot, but if you look at these two, we have a leucine, which is small and hydrophobic, in position 5, 19, 12, 13. And then we have lots of lysines and hydrophilic parts here, and there, Again, in the rest, there is no obvious pattern here, but if you look at it here, do you see that it's hydrophobic, hydrophobic, and then water soluble on the outside. So this will instantly cause these two phases of the helices to like each other. And that's effectively what you would have, what you would have to do, but you can have the computer help you if you want to design them. We can do that in a slightly more advanced way because that's, if you only have two helices, the problem is that you don't really have a whole lot of space here because it's gonna be perfectly packed. But if we do the same thing with four helices, you effectively have an inside here. And that you can use that to create small proteins with particular properties. I think this particular one is uh, one that can bind the heme group. Oh yes, I even say there. Uh, 
This one can bind a heme group, and that has been used with the idea of being able to create artificial red blood cells. So that you could have, it's a pure chemistry, there are no cells in this, but they would have a molecule that had at least some of the properties of hemoglobin that it could bind oxygen. There are drawbacks with that. It is not at all as fancy as hemoglobin in terms of this efficiency and releasing and binding oxygen. But in theory, it's something that you might be able to store. And there are also lots of people in the world that don't, wouldn't, wouldn't, either they wouldn't accept the blood donation for uh, religious reasons, and blood also decays very rapidly. Um, that it has a half-life of a few weeks or something, and that's why they constantly need new blood donors. So if we could artificially create this, you would have a molecule that would not have all the complications with matching different blood groups and anything. But it hasn't quite taken off. Um, it is available on the market, but it's not been a tremendous success. You could also use this way, if you have something that's hydrophobic on one side and hydrophilic on the other one, you can put fat on the inside. So fats are nice because, in particular in food, they, con they convey a lot of flavor. Uh, so we want fat in our food. But if we have too much fat, we end up being fat, literally. Uh, so you tend to use this as emulsifiers. So they will be water soluble on the outside, so the whole thing will be soluble in water, but the interior, there you can bind fat. So you can end up having, say, even margarine, where the margarine is actually only 15, 20, or 30 percent fat, but it can still bind all the tastes and everything. There are some problems with this, though. There's one particular problem that some of you might have noticed if you're a poor student and trying to, say, fry in uh, low-fat margarine. What happens if you take a low-fat margarine and try to fry in it? You can go home and do this experiment, but do it in a cheap pan because you might end up destroying the pan. Um, what suddenly, it looks great at first, uh, but in contrast to butter that would just melt, suddenly you get something strange water-like. So what happens as you're heating the protein, the protein falls apart. And then your whole emulsion falls apart. So you have a separation of water and fat, and suddenly you have lots of water in the pan. And apart from not being able to fry in it, uh, this is actually quite a large industry. In particular, Lund in the south of Sweden, they have had designed various proteins and emulsifiers to be able to withstand high temperature. So if you go out and buy, say, a creme fraiche or something, some of them will say that even the low fat range, that you can boil it. So then they've designed it with special emulsifiers that can withstand high temperature. I'm not sure whether that is, pro it might actually be proteins in that one particular one too. So the neat thing about doing this with proteins is what? Chemistry as well, you have lots of fancy emulsifiers in chemistry. Why should you do it with proteins? We're going to eat it, right? So that you probably don't want something toxic or that tastes horribly if you're going to eat it. So the neat thing with proteins, that's, that's what you have in muscles anyway, so that it's perfectly safe to eat protein and it tastes well. There are, why well, can't continue with this? Uh, there are certainly mixed alpha and beta domains too. Uh, the one thing to be aware of there, you typically don't mix helices sheets, but you tend to have them in disjoint domains. And the reason for that is that if you look at a helix, that helix can't really, it doesn't have any free hydrogen bonds to bind the sheets, right? And same thing with the sheet, it needs hydrogen bonds to be stable. So they can be right next to, you can have helix sheet, helix sheet, helix sheet in a sequence. But what you then would need to do is you can have a sheet going up and then the helix on the outside going down and then the sheet going up again and helix on the outside going down. So these barrels, they would have sheet, helix, sheet, uh, sorry, Helix sheet, helix sheet, helix sheet, et cetera. Or you could have a sheet, straight heat sheet in the middle, and then they go up, and then down with the helix on the side, and then go up again, and the helix on the side. Uh, this is alcohol dehydrogenase. And if you, it's Friday today, so I would really appreciate it if you go home and did it, well, either home or downtown, you might be able to do an experiment tonight, purely in the interest of science, of course. Um, if you drink alcohol, this is what breaks down the ethanol. Um, it's part of the whole process. And certain parts of the population on Earth actually have a deficiency in alcohol dehydrogenase. And that's why, so some of these things like, it almost sounds like cultural appropriation or, uh, or racism that say, for instance, that you're talking about like Asians in particular, they can't drink as much alcohol. Uh, but it's actually true. Uh, so that certain parts of the population in Asia, certainly not everyone, they have a deficiency in alcohol dehydrogenase. So they become significantly more intoxicated from alcohol. Um, 
So you might want to test. It's important to test whether you have a deficiency for this. So please help me with that experiment. Um, the, remember that ligand-gated ion channel I showed before? That is, the, that is one of the channels where the alcohol will bind and influence your nervous system. Lucy will talk about that on Monday. Um, so you will literally have the alcohol binding to that channel and change how it works. Rossmann fold is another example of this. I'm not going to go through all these folds, but the point is that most of these things were discovered in the 70s or 80s where we were able to determine structures uh, of proteins. And since I'm not going to spend a lot of time with you, uh, the part to be aware of, though, uh, is that most of these things, in particular with the sheets, on the edges of these things or between them, this is where you tend to have binding sites. Um, so the, the binding, because you have all the, the edges of, these, uh, of the molecules here or the secondary structure elements, that will really correspond to having free hydrogen bonds or so. So they typically create beautiful small cavities where you can bind things, such as an ethanol molecule or something, although this particular protein doesn't bind ethanol. Uh, and there are, is a number of combinations to do there. I'm, well, I'm all the time here, but for once I'm going to steal two minutes because it's Lucy and Burke who's going to be teaching you next week. These are important in one class of proteins that are binding DNA and RNA. So at first sight, these small molecules like almost look unstable, right? And they are kind of unstable. But when this floppy, unstable molecule then finds a DNA, it turns out that it, fit, it has evolved to fit perfectly in the large and the major groove here, so that the valley and the DNA sequence. So these are typically the proteins used to recognize where we should start reading your genetic material. And now we're going all the way back to the first lecture, because then I just hinted to, well, there are proteins that determine where to start reading. And nature has evolved that. Through the genetic material, we have evolved particular proteins to start recognizing the specific pattern in the DNA that would correspond to the start of the new protein. And this is how we find, well, this is certainly how we find uh, the sequences in bioinformatics, because we've uh, learned to recognize those patterns ourselves too. I already mentioned the toxin. This is another toxin, uh, Brazilian uh, scorpion toxin. Uh, it's a neurotoxin. And here, too, that you might have a, something that appears that the scientists screwed up a little bit in the structure determination. I would guess that this is a structure that becomes a complete beta sheet when it's binding to its partner. So that's, oh, sorry. So here, too, it's important to consider before and after and everything. All of these things have evolved to perfectly match the function. Uh, so with that, I think I have two more slides um, I'm going to show you that there is an interesting discussion that will we keep discovering folds? And the cool thing is that we, there is a very famous paper by Cyrus Shotia, uh, who died, fortunately, uh, in December, called A Thousand Folds for the Molecular Biologist. And the idea is that despite the astronomically large sequence space, it appears there are relatively few scaffolds, there are relatively few shapes in the ballpark of a thousand that nature uses and reuses and reuses. So re did you remember how many genes you had in your bodies? No, that's base pairs, but how many genes? Roughly 20,000. Sorry, you're not that complicated. There are only 20,000 building blocks. But those 20,000 building blocks, in turn, use only 1,000 building blocks. So there are only roughly 1,000 different shapes of proteins in your bodies. And that turned out to be a little bit of underestimation. It might be 1,500 or so, but I, we're getting to the point where we more or less discover these. We don't know all of them, but we know the vast majority of them. There are relatively few that are undiscovered. And that has opened an amazing map for protein engineering. We can actually design most of these things. Uh, and in most cases, things are uniquely defined, even if there are small changes in them or so. But there are a few cases that you can change less than half of the residues and say turn a beta sheet into an alpha helix or so. But typically, all these things have evolved to A, have the function they want, and B, be stable, so that they're not destroyed if I change one amino acid by mistake. Sorry for stealing a few extra minutes here. Lucy, there are a bunch of study questions here that uh, because it's gonna be Lucy taking over on Monday. Do mail me about this. I'm more than happy to do screen recordings and go through this in as much detail as you want. And on Monday, Lucy is gonna talk about membrane proteins because membrane proteins obey all these principles and they use the same thing. But in addition, they have these really nice functional things where they're acting like channels, locks, opening doors and windows. Uh, and that's also why they're so pharmaceutically important.
but with that, let's call it today and have a nice weekend.